Welcome to this service at Faith and Victory Church. This is the place to come to receive your miracle from God. Now, let's join our service already in progress. Being, let's verse, being filled with the fruits of righteousness, which are by Jesus Christ unto the glory and praise of God. But I would, you should understand, brother, that the things which happened to me have fallen out rather to the furtherance of the gospel. Now, Paul, Paul's telling them that, you know, the things he went through uh, advanced the gospel. Um, so that my bonds in Christ are manifest in the palace and in other places. And many of the brethren, the Lord waxing confident by my bonds, are much more, more bold to speak the word without fear. Now, we, went on, we did get here last week, and, or two weeks ago. And some... Um, Indeed, preach Christ even of envy and strife. They think they were doing him injury, and they didn't. Uh, supposing to add afflictions to my bonds. But the other of love, knowing that I am set for the defense of the gospel. What then? Notwithstanding, every way, whether in pretense or in truth, Christ is preached. And I therein do rejoice, yea, and will rejoice. Because even the people who are preaching in pretense, the Holy Ghost can take the word and pierce, pierces a person's heart. Okay? Uh, for I know that this, uh, that this shall turn to my salvation through your prayers and the supply of the Spirit of Jesus Christ, according to my earnest expectation and my hope that in nothing I shall be ashamed, but that with all boldness as always, so now also Christ shall be magnified in my body, whether it be life or by death. For me to live is Christ and to die is gain. But if I live in the flesh, and that is the fruit of my labor, yet what I shall choose I know not. Now, he's saying here that, um, you know, his life, either in death or life, he's going he's to testify of Jesus. He's going to be faithful and testify of the Lord right up to the end. Hallelujah. Amen. Uh, verse 23. This is one of the most important scriptures in understanding life and death. We have so many people that, you know, oh, it's your sure time, it's your time. You're going to die when you're going to die. You know, if something tragic happens, the Lord, you know, the Lord did that. And his, your time to go is just your time to go. You know, and we watch too many Grim Reaper movies. Read too many demonic novels and then applied Christianity to it. Paul, now the King James, a little weird word, wording here. I'm at a stretch between the two. Uh, Ed Taylor, modern day, I'm in a rock and a hard place. Okay. I'm, at a, I'm between a rock and a hard place, having, listen to this, a desire to depart and to be with Christ, which is far better. See, Paul came to understand that the spiritual life was more real and more important than the natural life as far as eternity was concerned. Nevertheless, to abide in the flesh is more needful for you. And having this confidence, I know that I shall abide and continue with you for all your furtherance and your faith, joy of your faith, that your rejoicing may be more abundant in Christ Jesus for me um, by my coming to you again. Now, Paul says here, I, I'm in a difficult place. I want to leave and go home, but you need me here. And I'm confident I'm staying. Paul had a choice. He could have gone. I said he could have gone. But he said, I, 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 want, I want to stay here because you need me. Okay. And I'm confident, I know that I shall abide and continue with you for your furtherance and for the joy of your faith. His de personal desire to go was superseded by his, his desire to honor God and please God and do the work of God and help more people. Yeah, he had his mandate. He had to finish, he had, had to finish his course. Now remember, Paul writes later in another place, he says, I've kept, I finished my course, I kept the faith, I, 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 I'm, you know, sorry, what was that? I fight the good fight, I kept the faith, I finished my course. Henceforth was laid up for me a crown. Now, he, he came to the place, he said, I'm done. I'm done, I'm ready to go. And he went not long after that. I've been, I've been in, the, in Rome where they, they uh, say they held, that Paul and both Peter were held in, in prison. Um, and uh, you wouldn't want to go there. I mean, as a prisoner. I mean, go visit, yeah, but you wouldn't want to go there and be a prisoner. They just drop you through a hole down. They just throw your food down and stuff there. And, you know, you know, kind of nasty conditions. All right. Only now, listen to this. Here is his words. So back, back up just a little bit, real quick. Paul could choose whether he went home or stayed, because of the need of others, he stayed. He could have left. 
he wanted to. See, we have more to do with living and dying than people, than people in the theological realm um, accept. Oftentimes, it's, it, we, we find a comfort in thinking God did it. And we're, we're, we're somehow um, trusting God by putting up with his, you know, his unknown, unseen, ununderstandable plan that we can't figure out. You know, he, 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 took, he took them, and we don't know why, but we just trust in the Lord. Yet Paul, you know, the, the Word of God says, with long life I'll satisfy you, over in the, in the 91st Psalm. With long life I'll satisfy you and show you my salvation. Children, obey your parents in the Lord. Well, this is right, and it's the first commandment we promise. What? That it may be well with thee that thou mayest live long on the earth. So the Bible tells us there are things we can do to either shorten or lengthen our life. One of them is how satisfied are you? Well, why, why, what do we do when bad things happen to good people? There's a bad devil. We're living in a fallen world. We have to exercise our authority. We have to stay on top of things. Amen. And if something tragic happens, we just can't go, okay, sirrah, sirrah, whatever will be, will be. God had that all planned out all along. I mean, you, you start think, thinking some of that stuff out and, caring, and, and go back and analyze that. We're saying God's guilty of murder. What's murder? The word murder doesn't mean to kill somebody. It means to take innocent life. If you, if you kill somebody in self-defense, that's not murder. It's self-defense. Amen. And actually in the Hebrew, where it says in the, in the Old Testament, uh, in, the, in the Big Ten, the top ten, Letterman, God had him before Letterman showed up. It says, thou shalt not commit murder. The Hebrew actually says, thou shalt not take innocent life. Now, the nutbags run and say, thou shalt not kill. I was at Washington for Jesus. They, you killed the animals. You got shoes on your feet. They were around in robes, but, you know, barefooted. You know, you killed the animals. You, you, know, you nutcases, go get off the LSD and the marijuana and all the other stuff you're dropping and go get saved. I mean, they're confronting everybody, trying to, you know, tell them that they're, they're guilty of, of killing because they killed the animals. Well, God told Peter, rise, kill, and eat. I love, I'm, I, am, I am a charter member of PETA. People for the eating of tasty animals. Hallelujah. Want me some pork barbecue? Glory to God. God cleansed it. Hallelujah. Now back up here. So God allows us to choose life and death, blessing or cursing. Choose you this day, life or death, blessing and cursing. Well, that was Old Testament. Come on, folks. Let's not be, let's not get so we get to thinking, you know, and divide things out. That somehow or another we got to a new covenant and God became an evil genie. Paul said to abide the flesh is needful. So I'm, I'm confident I'm staying. Amen. Then verse, he gets down to verse 27. It says, only let your lifestyle be as it becometh the gospel of Christ. Now let's stop there. I, I'm going to try not to get too far down my soapbox. But these bozos who say it doesn't matter what you do because you're under grace, Paul write. What did Paul write to the church? He didn't say do whatever you want to do. He said let your life, the conversation, not, not what you're talking about. Conversation is old Elizabethan for your, your manner of life, how you live, how you conduct yourself. Okay? So, I mean, so this only let the way you conduct yourself be as it becometh or, or be as it represents the gospel of Christ. We should live, well, I'm under grace. I'm righteous no matter what I do. Bless God, I can just do whatever I want to do, and God's going to keep blessing me financially. I'm going to keep getting all the blessings of God on me. Yet Paul didn't say do that. He said live your life in a way that represents the gospel of Christ. Well, the gospel of Christ is grace. I've got news for you. There's more to it than that. We've got to stop you know, uh, uh, Guy Dunnick, my friend Guy Dunnick, posted on Facebook today about, you know, uh, is, you know the Bible, what, do the, what do the New Testament writers write about? R repentance and sin. And he went on this with all the things he talked about. And um, I said, I, I comment, it's amazing what you get when you read the scriptures. You know, instead of taking what somebody in skinny jeans or bedhead says. Hello, I don't trust people in skinny jeans and bedhead. Just telling you. 
Hallelujah. Let your lifestyle, your conduct, be as it represents the gospel of Christ, that whether I come and see you or else be absent, I may hear of your affairs. In other words, let you live a way that there's going to be a testimony of how you're living, whether I show up or whether I'm just over, I go somewhere else, I go over to Ephesus instead of coming to Philippi, and I'm hearing about you over there. That ye stand fast in one spirit, with one mind, striving together for the faith of the gospel. <clears throat> and in nothing terrified by your evident token of perdition, but to, the, uh, but to you of salvation and that of God. But unto you it is given on behalf of Christ, not only to believe on him, but also to suffer for his sake. Having the same conflict which you saw in me and now hear to be in me. Now what did Paul suffer? Paul was continually suffering, suffering persecution for the gospel's sake. Now, the Bible does not say you will suffer sickness for the gospel's sake. Hello? It says you'll suffer persecution. And when Paul listed his persecution, it didn't say he was sick. Fastings often, nakedness often, uh, and um, um, and hungers, and, and I mean, he just goes on list all that stuff. He goes on three days and night in the deep, let down over the wall. I mean, in, in perils of his countrymen, in perils of this one, in perils in the city, in perils of this one. I mean, he list. He didn't say I, I was sick. The Lord put sickness on me to think. He talked about the persecutions he went through, the things he had to face because he was preaching the gospel, because he was, he was telling the truth, and the persecution and the attacks that came against him because of it. We are going to suffer persecution. For all those who live godly in Christ Jesus will suffer persecution. Amen. You're going to suffer persecution. You should. We're seeing it more and more now in America than we've ever seen it in, in, in uh, generations and since the founding of the country. We're being persecuted. We're being persecuted by the president. We're being persecuted by, um, you know, uh, atheists. I mean, even Christians are persecuting Christians. Hello? There's all kinds of stuff going on that the church is being persecuted. If you don't accept homosexuals, now they just arrested a, a pastor in Ireland, and they're going to charge him with hate speech for saying that the Muslims are satanic. Canada cannot preach against homosexuality as considered hate speech. They cannot read the Bible and say what the Bible says about it. You could be arrested. What is this? This is the diseased liberal mind persecuting the church. They're demonic. It just tells you where they are. They're demonic. They, are, they have a demonic mind. It's disease with, the, with, demo, with demonization. Hello? The president told the church they need to change their views on abortion and homosexuality. I think of both of them. The, the church needs to get, uh, change their views. I'm going to tell you that, Mr. President. You need to change your views. You don't tell the church what to do. You don't tell pastors what to do. Abortion and homosexuality are, are stenches in the nostrils of God. And we're not changing what we say. You can outlaw it, we're going to still say it. You can tell us we can't say it, you just have to drag us off to prison. Because we're going to preach the gospel. We're going to preach the truth, the good news. What's the good news to people who, who want to have abortion? Is that you don't have to do that. God, God can rectify and God can turn that situation around. I saw an article the other day. A girl got uh, raped at 12 years old and got pregnant and didn't have an abortion. And now the daughter that she has has become a blessing in her life. She, she could have given it up for adoption, and which would have been legitimately fine, but she didn't kill the baby. Hello? Well, she was raped. Well, you know what? Thank God for her. Now, see, the world doesn't applaud that kind of courage. The, the media doesn't applaud that courage. They applaud some bozo who thinks he's a woman cutting everything off and having stuff added on and making himself a woman. They're now got people called transable. There are people who are having their, their legs cut off surgically because they identify with paraplegics. The doctors, see, those people used to would be put into a place and get psychiatric help or psychological help. 
And the doctors who are doing these things ought to be charged with mutilation. They ought to be charged with some kind of crime. Simply because they psychologically say they identify with paraplegics and having their legs cut off. Now, I said something about this about three months ago when they were starting to talk about, you know, Chastity Bono. You know, they had a big article, a psychologist, a well-known psychologist had a big article on her about the fact that having cutting body parts off because she didn't identify a female anymore. That he said this, that the, the, the media and the world is applauding that. The doctors are doing this. And he says, and this person needs serious help. They are psychologically sick. They need help. And instead of that, we embellish it, we encourage it, and we applaud that move. Society is sick. Society is demonized. Now I got people who want to cut their legs off. You know, you got people, have you, you seen the picture of the, uh, one picture of some guy? He's got gauges so big in the side of his jaws, they're about this big around. He, when he opens his mouth, you can, I mean, you can see the front and all the way through both sides. I mean, big, huge, where they got it gauged out. Not ears, the jaws. And he's got, his tongue is split so he can be like a lizard. And he, he sticks through the hole and all that. There is a sickness, it's not even a sickness, there is a spirit of the destroying man's body which was created in the image. God's spirit, our spirit was created in the image of God, but our body represented our, our spirits. Hello? How did I get off on that? Huh? Somebody help me. How did I get over there? Because it's true. Okay. Because it's true. Oh, homosexuality and all, and all, you know, we are applauding things, yet the Bible does the church, is, oh, persecution, you'll suffer. They're all suffering. The church is being, is suffering persecution for telling the truth called hate mongers, homophobes, evil, all this because we don't accept someone's perverse sexual lifestyle. Hello? Now, I'm just going to tell you, you show up at my church with your little boy lover, and I'm going to beat the snot out of you. I don't care if it's legal by then or not. That's the next step. Just, you just know it. I will beat you. Isn't that love? I will lay hands on them hard, fast, and continuously. Hello? It's already become, it's already the next step and already the next mantra that's going on. And the homosexual say, oh, that's not, that's not going to happen. That's not going to happen. <laughs> so go say that for Oprah and Dr. Phil. They're the only two listening to that kind of stupid stuff. Not me. Amen? We are just, we're going to suffer persecution. And we're being persecuted at every turn in the church. If you stand up for righteousness, you're a hate speech. Hello? If you stand up for truth, you're a hate monger. But if you embellish and embrace radical lunacy, you're, you are such a loving person. We've had major ministers come out and say that, you know, after a long period, a season of prayer and seeking the Lord, they're now saying that we should accept the homosexual community into the church. No, we shouldn't. And we never will. If they shut the doors down and take our 501c3 away, we will meet in a field somewhere and preach the gospel. Hello. Because I am not, I mean, you can persecute, but you cannot. Do, and I, just, just, just let me give you a little heads up, Mr. Whoever you want to persecute the church. When persecution came on the church in the Bible, it got stronger and it got spread and more people got saved. So more is going to happen for the kingdom by your persecution than you could ever put out. Hallelujah. Amen. I'm going to get out there. But also to suffer for his sake. Now, I'm not going to suffer by being stupid. I'm not bombing abortion clinics. I'm not shooting people. I'm not going to kill people. We're going to keep telling them God loves them and invite them to come into the kingdom, but I'll never stop saying what they're doing is wrong. We, the, the girl who has an abortion where the little Planned Parenthood bozo sit in there and tell them it's just a surgical procedure on fetal, uh, on, um, fetal tissue aren't there when they're sitting there at night and, and, and they're going through the guilt and the pain of a killing a life that they know was in them. 
I know people who've had abortions, and I've talked with them, and they suffered for years. Some of them became drug addicts. Some of them died early. Some of them had a lot of things happen in their life because of the guilt of what they did. But that little person sat behind the desk because they needed that $600 for the clinic. Oh, it'll be take about an hour and a half. You'll be done. Hello. Let's move on to chapter 2. If there be any consolation in Christ, if any comfort of love, any fellowship of the Spirit, if any bowels and mercies, fulfill ye my joy, and be ye like-minded, having the same love, being of one accord and one mind. Let nothing be done through strife or vainglory, but in lowliness of mind, let each esteem other better than themselves. Boy, that would work good in church if we did that, wouldn't it? If everybody just esteemed others better than themselves, we'd have a whole lot better thing going on. There's too much. It's all about me and what about me and what about my rights and what about this. That's the world. What do you think is going on in our country right now? If everybody esteemed everybody above themselves, we wouldn't have half, uh, uh, 75% of the problems we've got going on in this country. Well, I want my due. I want my say. I want my, I want my pound of flesh. I want this. I want that. You've got to tolerate me. You've got to tolerate my lifestyle. You've got to tolerate what I think. You've got to tolerate what I say. Unless you're a Christian. Now, if you're a Christian, nobody has to tolerate you. They don't tolerate anything we say. We have to tolerate the Muslims. We've got to tolerate the homosexuals. We've got to tolerate the abortionists. We've got to tolerate the transgender. We've got to tolerate the lesbians. We've got to tolerate everything, everybody all over the place. But nobody has, can, is required to tolerate a Christian. But we are to be like-minded. We are to have loving mind to esteem other better than themselves. Let me say this. Primarily, this is talking about the church esteeming one another. You know how many church splits have taken because people took offense for something that somebody else did? You know why people leave churches? Because they get offended about something. Pastor didn't say it the right way. Pastor said this. They didn't like that. He, he didn't do such and such. The old song, uh, there's an old, old southern gospel song called Excuses. Excuses, excuses, you hear them every day. The devil will supply them if from church you'll stay away. The devil knows, they, let's see, what is it? When people come to know the Lord, the devil always loses. So to keep them folks away from church, he offers them excuses. Then, then, then they start listing all the excuses. Well, he preaches too long. He preaches too short. It's too hot. It's too cold. Chairs are too hard. They're too soft. And then, and then they go, and one little lady goes, well, he didn't even shake my hand. And this song keeps going. Brother Bill, remember? Yep, Brother Bill remembers. Hallelujah. And, and there's so much truth in that song that people get offended. If we would just honor one another and prefer one another, including the pastor, we'd have less church splits, we'd have less church strife, we'd have less church mess-ups, and we'd get more done for the kingdom. Well, I'm going to go over to that church. They got a lot of love. Now, usually, when I hear somebody saying that, it usually means they're getting their way. They're getting to do what they want to do. There's so much love there. Well, I left, so I left Faith and Victory and I went to so-and-so because they got a lot of love over there. And the implication is we don't. Now, if you consider love telling you what you want to hear, giving you your way, letting you be a spoiled, stinking Christian brat, then maybe that I don't have any love. But I believe the love of God constrains me to teach the truth whether you like it or not, so that you can be adjusted and changed and, and, and matured in Christ so that you don't have to keep, keep going through the same things over and over and over again in life and, and living defeated because you're getting your way all the time. Hello? I'm willing, you know, and, and, and there's, there, no, there are places that won't tell the truth because they don't want to lose people. I know it probably upset some people that I, di I didn't jump up and down and scream and hoot and holler that Obama won the presidency, but I'm sorry. Yeah. And I'm going to tell you what, if there's a white Republican that wins that's, that's pro-abortion and pro-homosexual, he ain't going to get my vote or my support. Yeah. I'm just going to tell you. Yeah. Well, I mean, you know, what's the choice? I, I, can't, I'm not, I cannot in good conscience vote for anyone. Yeah. Republican, 
Democrat, white, black, female, male, that supports the killing of unborn children and supports, as a, a, supports relationships based on perverse sexual activity. Yeah, but there, I, I remember when, when one of the presidents was running back in the, in the night of Clinton and somebody was in the church. And, and he was pro-abortion and, and, and so forth. And that, that was a big sticking point. And somebody in our church, one of our leaders, they're not here anymore, said, yeah, but he's got an economic policy to get people back to work. What do you talk about an economic policy? He wants to kill babies. He's for the killing of the unborn. And you as a Christian can support that. I will never be able to do that. Well, Pastor, that's your stand. I'm, I'm a liberal Christian. I can, do, I can believe otherwise. Well, you, you go talk to Jesus about it. I'll guarantee you he's not for it. And I don't want to be the doctors who killed all them babies and stand before the throne of judgment. The great white throne of judgment when the lake of fire is just over there. Just be honest with you. Okay. Is that it? Oh, we got plenty of time. Hallelujah. <clears throat> Let us esteem each other better than themselves. Look not on every man on his own things, but every man also on the things of others. Let this mind be in you. Which also was in Christ Jesus. All right, we're supposed to, what, supposed to do what? Have the mind that Jesus had. Think the way the Lord thought. Who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God. But made himself of no reputation. One translation says stripped himself of his rights to deity and to glory. And took upon him the form of a servant and was made in the likeness of men. And being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. Now stop. Now, I remember I told you, somebody, somebody told me one time that big, long conversation uh, on, some, on Facebook. I don't do this anymore. I, I just don't get in there and argue with people. I'm not, I, I learned hard to fix stupid. I hate to say, you, I, I'm kind of trying to back off and say you can't fix stupid, but it's pretty doggone hard. Okay? Pretty much you can't fix stupid. Anyway, <clears throat> but they said, I thank God I don't have to obey. Then the word of God tells me they have the same mind that Christ had, and he was obedient even under death. And if, so what does that mean? As a born-again believer under the grace of God, who is empowered by God to fulfill the will of God, one of the things that I'm going to do is have the mind of Christ and walk in obedience towards God. Jesus did it even unto death. His obedience cost him his life, natural life on the earth. How much more should we be doing the same thing? Walking in obedience towards the Father. Walking in obedience towards, towards the things of God. And so because he has saved me, because I have the life of God on the inside of me, because I'm graced by God to carry out God's will, I'm going to carry out part of that will by being obedient. I do have to obey if I'm going to honor God. If I'm going to have the same mind that Christ had, I'm going to have to be obedient. Amen? Even the death of the cross. Wherefore, God also hath highly exalted him. Now, we got a lot of folk in the church who want the exaltation without the obedience and submission. Can I get a grunt somewhere in the building? Brother Bill. Thank you. See, we get people running along and they want to preach the blessing side without the commitment side or the obedience side or, or whatever. They go and get a whole bunch of old uh, Dad Hagen tapes on faith. You can have what you say. Get to have what you can say mini book. They get to have what you can say uh, audio series. And they run around and start confessing, I got this and I got that. And they don't listen to all the teachings that he had over his ministry. They don't listen to him talking about the times that he was driving on a car with bald tires, so bald he couldn't drive them during the day. They blow out from the heat. Then selling the car for junk because he couldn't pay the payment and he had to pay off the rest of the car with selling it for junk. And, and walk to bus stations and, you know, <clears throat> get where he could go as best he could. Hello? Don't hear the part of, of paying the price to get somewhere with God. Y'all hear you gone home. No. They just see, they just, they just see the end of life where, you, got, you know, the, the sister Aretha had a Jaguar. Somebody, somebody bought her a Jaguar. 
XJ, I forgot what it is, is, is one of the sedans back in the 90s. Well, praise God. He can believe God. I can have one too. Yeah. Did you pay the price? Did you obey God? Did you go when you stayed in the minister's home to preach the gospel and they didn't even take care of feeding you? You had a buck to buy your, or to pay your uh, um, annual fee to the denomination to keep your papers and the only thing in the house to eat was a frozen hot dog for you and your wife. Not a package, a hot dog. Put it on the stove and boil it and ate it. And go to the closets of the pastor's wife and she's got mink furs in there because they're both out working full-time jobs. He wouldn't quit the ministry because uh, the war was on. So they're, they've gone to the factories to work and to make money and the money's good. Except after the war, he lost the anointing and lost his ministry and yet wasn't preaching anymore. Dad was still out there. See, there's a price to pay in the things of God. I don't, I don't believe that. I'm sorry. You're going to, you, let's, folks, we're going to have to learn something. Anybody can quit. And anybody can keep going when everything's great. When all the money's there. When everybody in the world, you know, you're, you know, you're a faith church. I remember the day back in the uh, uh, late 70s and early 80s, you could have taken a shingle. I'm talking about, you know, sign. Go down some back alley somewhere, hang it up, not advertise, and the place will fill up. Those days are over. Hello? It's all about marketing now. It's about having the right look, about the right this, the right that. You know, those days are over right now. And who's staying when it ain't easy? And if you're going to live by faith, you're going to suffer persecution. You're going to deal with difficulties, but look, Jesus became obedient even to the death of the cross, but look what here happens. Wherefore, what? Because he was obedient even to the very giving of his life, God hath highly exalted him. You don't get the exaltation without the obedience. Somebody say amen. You're not going to, you're not going to get in all the goodies if you're not willing to pay the price that the people you see getting all the goodies did to get the goodies. Now, I'm not talking about they've manipulated people. I'm talking about people who've paid the price. I think Sister Hagen wrote a book, The Price Isn't Greater Than the Glory. I mean, she, paid, she, she followed Dad to, I mean, she followed him down to places that a lot of women won't go. I'm, I, I'm, they're packing up and leave. I'm done with this mess. But wherefore, Why? Wherefore means it's based on something. It's not, you just can't jump in and go, God highly exalted Jesus. Gave him a name above every name. No. Wherefore. Wherefore. He got highly exalted because he was completely obedient. I said he got highly exalted because he was completely obedient. And it's time we in the church start preaching things other than you're going to get blessed no matter what you do. No, you're going to have to pay some prices. You're going to have to, you're going to, have to commit to the will of God. You're going to have to go through the tough places and see it through and win. Jesus in Luke chapter 4. How many of you ever read Luke chapter 4? I hope you have. But the Bible says this after he, he came to John, John the Baptist and was baptized and the Spirit of God descended upon him and, the, and, the Holy, and, and God said, this is my beloved Son in whom I'm well pleased. And uh, the Bible says this, and he was led by the Spirit into the wilderness. Actually says this, and Jesus being full of the Holy Ghost was led by the Spirit into the wilderness. Being tempted 40 days in uh, I'm saying, fasting, being tempted 40 days, either, either eating or drinking anything, being tempted of the devil. Amen. After 40 days, he was a hunger. And Satan appeared to him and said, if you be God's son, turn this stone into bread. He said, it's written that man shall not live by bread alone. And then Satan, um, Satan took him into the high place and showed him all the kingdoms of the world. Hello? And said, uh, all these are mine. And I will give it to you if you'll bow down and worship me. 
Now, the fact is, it was a legitimate king, uh, uh, temptation. Adam had delivered the kingdoms of the world into Satan's hand. Well, said, Satan was lying. The lie was, he'll give it to him. If you will bow down and worship me. Jesus said, it's written, thou shalt not worship the Lord thy God, him only shalt thou worship. And Satan took him to the pinnacle of the temple and said, cast thyself down from here. Uh, for it is written that the angels shall bear thee up, lest thou dash thy foot against the stone. And Jesus said, it's also written, thou shalt not tempt the Lord thy God. And Satan left him for a season. And the Bible says this, and he returned in the power of the Spirit. He went in full, he came out in the power. See, we got all these Christians who want to have the power, but they don't want to get full and go into the place where they have to, have to win. You got to win the battle. You got to you fight the good fight of faith. You can't lay down. People say, you know, I, uh, one thing my friend Guy said on one of his Facebook posts recently was, everybody's talking about resting, resting, resting. And there's a whole lot in the Bible about acting, acting, acting. <clears throat> The book of Acts is not called the book of Acts. It's called, you know, the book of rest is called the book of Acts. Hello? Well, he that's entered into faith is entered into rest. Not that you're not doing anything. You're resting from doing it in the power of the flesh. Amen. Working 75 jobs, you know, you're, you're still doing, you're still doing the things God says, but you're empowered by God to, to carry it out and to see it done. The rest is not resting on snoring on the couch. The rest is the rest from human effort to do a spiritual job. You're walking in the grace of God to fulfill and carry out what God said to do. You're preaching the gospel. You're graced, empowered to preach. You're graced for the journey. Amen. But you're not laying down doing nothing and, and, and fornicating and smoking dope and shooting up and still expecting to get blessed. That's not rest. That's stupidity. Thank you for your enthusiasm. Wherefore God highly exalted him and gave him a name which is above every name. That at the name of Jesus every knee should bow of, uh, and that says of being, of things in the King James, that word things is italicized, not in the Greek. The inference here is of beings. The trees don't bow, the mountains don't bow. The truth is, the angels, the principalities, the powers, the rulers of the darkness of this world, all the seraphims and cherubims and all the angels of heaven and, and, and all human spirits everywhere in heaven, earth, or hell bow their knee to Jesus at that name. That at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow of things in heaven or beings in heaven, beings in the earth and beings under the earth. That's heaven, earth, and hell. And that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Wherefore, beloved, as you have always obeyed. Now, wow, I don't have to obey. You have you, as you always obeyed. As you have always obeyed, not as in, in my presence only, but now much more in my absence. Work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. Now, this is mess of, this will mess a lot of faith people up. What does it mean, work out your salvation? It means walk it out. Amen. You have, to, you have to let the work of salvation, of soterius, working in you, produce the fruit of righteousness that you have. You have to walk it out. You live it. You do it. For it is God which worketh in you both to will and to do of his good pleasure. God, that, that, what's that? That's the grace. God's at work in you, working it out in you as you walk it out. He doesn't snatch you up off the couch and make you go do it. Amen. I can guarantee you, if you come in here with your wallet full of money and you don't take out money and put it in the offering, God's not going to knock you in the floor and snatch out your wallet and throw it in the offering bucket. No, that's something you've got to do. Amen? Do all, th all right, we got to stop here. Verse 13, we're going to stop, all right? We trust that you were blessed by the Word of God and the flow of the Spirit of God in this service. If you would like to contact us, please write us via email at office at fbc.org or using our mailing address, P.O. Box 7752, Greensboro, North Carolina, 27417. If you would like to contribute to our ministry, 
please go to our website at www.fbc.org and click on the Giving Online button. Thank you, and may God richly bless you for your giving.